cybersecurity for the blockchain. It's not something I know a lot about. In fact, I'll probably be the first to admit, I don't know much at all about the blockchain, and especially cybersecurity, and adding safeguards, and making sure there isn't hacks, and malware, and exploits, and vulnerabilities in the blockchain. So, when my good friends over at Halborn, those are really great people, fantastic folks, and super duper smart, they were teaming up with SANS to host the SANS Blockchain Security Summit. Now, I, a simpleton, a knave, thought, hey, it'd be cool, I want to come take a look, I want to see what I can learn, and see if I can learn something to get a little bit more spun up on blockchain security. So I went and attended and it was really awesome. They actually had a fantastic keynote. Uh, Steve Walbrill, forgive me if I get your name wrong, my friend. He had a fantastic keynote talking about this transition between what we kind of considered cybersecurity in the day in the world today, I guess web two, if you want to use those words and lingos and numbers, right? Web two compared to web three. And what new changes are coming along because it's a very, very different scene, right? It's a completely different world. Uh, what we might think of as traditional, original, I, I can't say cookie cutter because that's not the right word, but right, active directory attacks and, you know, the stuff that we tend to see for cross-site scripting, that feels very web two, quote unquote. Web three, it's a different thing. You've got the smart contracts, you've got audits, you've got DAOs, etc. And it's just so much new to think about and how we kind of represent that as to the way that we're used to thinking about it with like an OSI model, right? What does the OSI model look like for blockchain? It's very, very different. What is a MITRE attack framework or what are these standards that we're kind of used to uh, holding ourselves to and understanding the world with? How does that compare in the whole blockchain world? I think it's wild because it brings, uh, it's, it's not in my opinion, just a John opinion, right? It's not a whole replacement, but it certainly supplements what we've all seen before. It's an, it, it's augmenting how we understand cybersecurity. But when you think about vulnerabilities, when you think about exploits, when you think about attacks in these two things, right? What we're used to is information disclosure and leaks and something that might be able to get credit cards or social security numbers or information. Okay, sure. Put out on the dark web, scared around in these onion websites and sold for uh, uh, hackers for hire and malware marketplaces, etc. And that might make a couple bucks, maybe $35 for someone's full biographical and demographic info, maybe a hundred, maybe a thousand. I don't know. Depends how well you do the deal. But if you find a vulnerability in cryptocurrency and blockchain, obviously there's real money on the line always. And that could just straight up mean a vulnerability, no matter what it might seem to be. And we might scoff, oh, it's a cross-site scripting thing, something that we could kind of consider trivial. It could mean serious financial reprimands in that blockchain world. And that could mean millions of dollars lost every single time which is crazy. You think of the impact that a vulnerability in a bug could have, that's paramount and like tenfold in that whole new world. So anyway, I'm sorry for me rambling. I wanted to chat a little bit about the Blockchain Security Summit. It was super duper cool. All the talks are recorded if you have any interest. I believe except for one uh, that was, a, there's an individual from the FBI that was talking about, hey, what this new age of, you know, cryptocurrency being a certain sort of getaway car in some cases for cyber criminals and threat actors doing weird shady stuff. It's wild to see what is the rise, how is the trajectory changing now that this thing is entered the ecosystem and it's here to stay i think <laughs> it's uh, we can't it's not going away anytime soon right i personally attended one of the workshops i thought hey maybe a beginner friendly and accessible hand holding workshop would be super duper cool there was tons of viable information in there and it did get hands on and practical which is absolutely what i want to do cuz i want to learn this thing so let me show you super quick i got to crack open a virtual machine that's kind of tailor purpose and dedicated to doing this blockchain security testing and development and getting into rust and solidity and all this cool stuff that is a whole new world to me, thankfully, because this is put together by Halborn and the folks that already knew what they're up to. And it's like, it's like a Kali Linux. It's like a, a, a slingshot. It's like a Remnux. It's like a distribution of Linux dedicated with all the tools included for the work that you might end up doing. It's open source end to end already compiled across different architectures. Super duper cool. So you can go ahead and download it. And this is Zion. 
For one thing, it's super slick. It looks pretty awesome. And you don't have to waste time configuring anything or trying to figure out what tools you need. It gives you just about everything you already need already there. I think it's kind of cool to even actually reference, hey, Kali Linux is a little bit of an origin and inspiration. And seriously, this is put together by the team over at Halborn. So already incredible fellows doing incredible things. Here they talk about their selling points, but really you want to be diving into the fun stuff. You can go ahead and start the download. I'll hit that button here. They do have already built machines available for VirtualBox or for VMware, or if you're over in that Apple ecosystem doing Mac stuff, you've got a download already ready for you. This does take a significant amount of time to download. I think it was about 10 gigs. And notice they have hardcore requirements here. They say about 16 gigs of RAM and like 512 gigabytes of storage. Look, you don't need that uh, immediately if you aren't doing like hardcore all the time, always blockchain auditing and security development. But hey, if you wanted to go all the way in, you absolutely could. You can tone that down safely if you're just kind of poking around and playing. If you click on the how to install Zion or hit the docs, you get to be brought over to this get the Zion VM up and running in a super sweet read the docs setup. And honestly, this looks awesome. You kind of get a little bit of a speed run on everything that you need to do. And then you can see what tools are included and everything that you might end up using if you're doing some specific work specific to a protocol or working in Rust or lurking through the Ethereum virtual machine or putting things together in Go. A lot of really, really cool stuff you can do for fuzzing here and anything that you just might feel you need within the environment. And of course, you can install whatever you need if there's more to it. So let me spin up Zion on my machine. I'll go ahead and power on this virtual machine. I am using VMware in my case, but VirtualBox will work just as well. Zion's booting up here. And here we go. We can go ahead and log in. Zion is our user. His password is Zion, all lowercase. And with that, we can be brought in to the virtual machine. Now, check out all the applications up here. If you wanted to check out anything specific to your system, you can can with that upper left Z icon for Zion, but the applications in here are broken down into, again, those specific protocol tools you might have seen in the docs. You also have the Ethereum virtual machine tools, Rust, Golang, etc. All the stuff that you might be interested in already accessible for you. So if we wanted to fire up a terminal, we absolutely could, and here we are inside of the Zion Terminal already has some things ready for us here. I see there's an Electrum, Electrum image, and we have Go install, and if I wanted to try and work with Rust, I absolutely could. If I wanted to work with Solidity, I absolutely could, or any Solana utilities. I believe Near is also in here just as well. So plenty of cool things to dive into. And what I want to showcase really is this small challenge that was presented during the workshop and it's just small it's just trivial it's something to kind of get your feet wet but it is going to be exploring what you can do with a private key that you might find slewn somewhere on the internet. Maybe someone accidentally shared, oh, the QR code for their wallet. Uh, and this was all kind of based off of their workshop that they were using to discuss getting into this smart contract shenanigans here. Uh, and this is the start of it here. This is actually seeing this QR code, knowing that, okay, this is the representation of a private key. So I'm gonna go ahead and download this. You'll notice I already downloaded it, so I do have it already present in my downloads folder already. So I'll go ahead and remove the one that I just downloaded, but I did want to show you that process. It's super quick, super simple. Let's hop back over to our terminal. I'll move into downloads, and now we have that file here. Now we want to go ahead and scan this QR code, right, to get the legitimate value of what this private key or wallet address is looking like, right? So you could use a tool like Kobang. Kobang is included in Zion, and it is something that you could just simply open up if you wanted to go ahead and drag in or upload a specific file, and that would render it out and give you the raw results here. You could do the very, very same with ZBar image, which is a command line tool that I am most used to, but you would need to go ahead and install it. So that is a pseudo apt install ZBar tools. And we do have ZShell's autocomplete already installed and ready for us, which is why you saw that already created here. So, but if I were to go ahead and just simply run ZBar image on that private key note, you can see it turns out this private address here. Hex, starting with the 0x, 598BD, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we wanted to know what this wallet could be within Ethereum. So you could do a couple different things. You could slap this into MetaMask, and I will go ahead and open that up 
here. I'll go ahead and create or import a new account. Uh, you'll need to enter the private key string, which we can just paste as the 0x that we've learned previously. That'll take just a moment, and this is the amount of Ethereum that we have noted in this account. If you wanted to, you could go actually check out what that wallet address is by clicking on that now. If you were to actually go ahead and actually click on the three vertical dots here, you could see the account details. That will give you the uh, public key or the wallet address. And if you wanted to, you could go ahead and view this account on the Etherscan tracer. Here's that view account on Etherscan. That brings us to it. And we could see some of the previous transactions here. Now, there are a couple interesting ones here. All this is within, okay, the three days ago time frame because, hey, this is everything that they were setting up for the workshop. Now, the latest one is something that they wanted to kind of showcase here. If you went to go see what they were transferring out to, notice that all the others had an issue. That, oh, they're out of gas, so they can't really perform that transaction. But now going out to this previous one, scrolling down to this wallet, we can assume, oh, maybe this wallet was already compromised because someone had already seen this private key. So that last transaction actually has an admin withdraw transaction some time ago. So they may have taken some money out. And let's go ahead and look at that specific transaction, clicking on the 0xf55, etc. And scrolling down, we can kind of get a little bit more information about what happened during this transaction. When it was, what block it was on, who it came from, who it went to, et cetera, and the value that would have been used here in Ethereum. Now, if you wanted to click to see more, you could get some other information. You could see the admin withdraw function that was being called here and some input data that could have been supplied. If you wanted to view input data in a different way, you absolutely could, or try and decode this, and you might be able to receive or see some interesting data that would have been passed into that function. If we switch this back and decode it as UTF-8, we end up tracking down what would have been the quote-unquote flag for this challenge, or that kind of treating this as a CTF or a capture the flag event and exercise. This ending here. SEC554 hacker, uh, some cute lead speak for SEC554, which is the SANS course where they end up going to be showcasing blockchain and uh, smart contract security. They've just now amped this up to a five-day course uh, all put together by, again, Steve, who's running that workshop and rocking it over at Halborn. So that's something pretty cool, pretty interesting, and just a nice little Easter egg if folks had any interest in diving into this thing, getting hands-on with Zion, learning about all these things, and doing some of your own testing within Solidity and Rust and the real protocols rather than just kind of, hey, tracing around it on Etherscan or some of the others. But all still super cool stuff, enough to get our feet wet and enough to kind of find a flag here. So I enjoyed that. And I thought, you know what, this was some cool exposure. This was a lot of fun. If you wanted to get into a little bit more extracurricular, you could try to figure out how we might convert a private key into an Ethereum wallet public address. And this is what I ended up doing, honestly, before uh, diving into MetaMask. I thought, oh, I wonder if there's a way to do that from the command line. So I found this article from Free Code Camp, which is awesome and phenomenal. And they kind of showcase, hey, this is what you could do. And this is how you might want to understand a little bit more of the math behind it. Say you had a private key, but if you want to learn some of the cryptography behind this thing, it is using ECDSA or elliptic curves here. Uh, and if, honestly, you could build this in Python. So thankfully, scrolling through this as you learn a little bit more about it uh, and as you see how this is all put together, I am just kind of cruising through here because they get into creating the checksum and learning about all the other algorithms that you might be using to work with those hashes. Truthfully, I'm a-okay with all that. If you'd like to read up about it, you're more than welcome to. That's really how they end up determining the public key. But it is all put together in a nice GitHub repository. And it's actually going to be a library you can pretty easily install and use. So if I wanted to pip install blocksmith that is how you might be able to retrieve or generate private keys or a wallet from a private key so this is the syntax that we need we just need to go ahead and install blocksmith so what i would end up doing is pip install blocksmith as you can see i already previously done and we've got this uh private key hex here what we could do is go ahead and move into python and i'll import blocksmith just as it's suggesting, and I'll specify that key variable being 
only the hex portion here because it'll probably be unhexified with bin ascii or, or something in python right so you don't need the leading 0x at the very very start i will remove that and now honestly we could just kind of pull together this syntax we'll just copy and paste hey they're using the blocksmith ethereum wallet generate address and slap this in here if I print this, you'll notice EBE1437, this is the very, very same as what MetaMask gave us just a moment ago. You can see EB, and I think if I actually zoom in on that, oh, there we go, EB1437, the very, very same as what we have already calculated within Python. So that's a neat thing. Hey, uh, aren't reliant on MetaMask if nerds are interested in that. But anyway, I had a whole lot of fun taking a look at the Halborn and Sands Blockchain Security Summit. I learned a couple new things, and I'm excited to go see what else we could dive into. Maybe it'd be kind of fun to play Ethernauts or Crypto Zombies or just get a little bit more exposure and be hands-on with this thing. I don't know Rust. I, I don't know Solidity. I, I know a little bit of Golang, but how often are you going to see that? I guess it's there a little bit. Uh, I don't know. All things that I'd be super interested in learning about. I know Nomsec is doing some incredible stuff with Halborn just as well, kind of spread the knowledge. Uh, also, Halborn has just released a recent Protocol Wars video, which was a series that I did with some members of their team to kind of interview them and get their thoughts. Hey, what protocol is the best protocol and why? Is there such thing? What can you tell me about Near? What can you tell me about Ethereum? What can you tell me about all these other things? And uh, I had a whole lot of fun. And if you'd like, please go check that out. I have that over on their channel because they should get some love too for all the sweet stuff that they're up to. So if you haven't, go take a look at the sans blockchain security summit some of the recordings are already available i believe or if not they will be absolutely soon and good learning <laughs> thanks so much for watching everybody hope you enjoyed and we'll see what more of a mess we can get into with some of this stuff and shenanigans here i love y'all i'll see you in the next video